Maybe it was the middle of the night. Maybe it was a frigid, cloudy winter afternoon. Or maybe it was somewhere in between. The point is, no one knows exactly when the ground broke. All we know is that it happened all at once and after 400 million years. Recently, I got to spend one of those frigid, cloudy winter afternoons at a place I've been wanting to visit for more than a year. It's called Kichitakippi, or the Big Spring, and it has one heck of a story. To me, the story starts about 420 to 440 million years ago, which is so long ago, I can't even really wrap my mind around it. But to give you some reference points, this was way before humans, way before dinosaurs, and right around the time the first documented animals were showing up on land, at least depending on where in that window you look. Also, because the continents drift over time, the land that's now Michigan was located south of the equator. And also, it was underwater. Scientists call this time period the Silurian, or I've also heard Silurian. Regardless, during the Silurian, melting ice meant sea levels rose significantly, and in all that water lived some pretty incredible forms of life. Like jawless fish were especially widespread and diverse, and from what scientists can tell, the first jawed fish also showed up during this time period, sharing space with neighbors like trilobites, mollusks, and more. Over millions of years, as these animals grew and lived and died, layers of sediment settled out on the bottom of the sea, made of things like dirt and dust from rocks, decomposing bits of living things, and shells and skeletons from clams and corals. And together, they formed layers upon layers of mud. Now, eventually, the Silurian seas fell away and the water withdrew from what's now Michigan, and all that mud was left high and dry. But not for long. Over the following millions of years, as the continents moved and life evolved and Earth changed, new seas flooded this area, leaving behind their own layers of mud, only to get buried by even more sediment and new rock later on. And in the end, this whole region got so buried that that mud from the Silurian got compressed and turned into stone, largely a kind called limestone. Here, the thing to know about limestone is that it's like, not particularly tough, at least compared to some other kinds of rock. With enough water, you can pretty easily wear this stuff away. And time was happy to do that. Now, okay, that said, the timeline for this next part of the story is a little fuzzy. I couldn't find any sources that said exactly when these next events happened, and it's possible we don't know. So I'm going to take an educated guess and skip way ahead to only eight thousand years ago, which is basically yesterday compared to the Silurian. At this point in history, what we now call Michigan was at virtually the same spot on the globe that it is today, and glaciers had already come and gone and carved away huge sections of rock in the Upper Peninsula. So now that long buried Silurian limestone is right up near the surface again. Somewhere around this time, rain and melting snow started seeping into a particular layer of cracked Silurian limestone called the Cataract Formation. As that water flowed through cracks in the limestone, it dissolved the rock, creating tunnels and caverns. Basically, the water was worming its way through an ancient lithified seabed. So take a moment to picture this. It's Michigan 8,000 years ago, and you're looking out over an evergreen forest or maybe a clearing or a swamp. Either way, the ground in the distance seems still and stable. But Things have been changing under there for a long time. Groundwater has been wearing away at that Silurian limestone for centuries, if not millennia, creating an underground cave more than 40 feet tall. And then suddenly, the roof of the cave gives way. The mud that formed more than 400 million years ago, that has since hardened and turned into rock, that rock falls apart. The ground collapses and a deep pit is formed. And over time, that pit fills with water to become a spring. Today, it's called Kichitakippi in the Anishinaabe language, or the big spring to some folks in English, and it is entirely beautiful. You can take a raft out into the middle of the spring and watch water burst up through the remains of a more than 400 million year old ocean floor. In fact, more than 10,000 gallons of water floods this spring every minute, ultimately flowing out to a much larger lake nearby. For the record, all that water doesn't 
seem to come directly from rain and melting snow. I found a paper published in 2020 that references a deep aquifer that feeds the spring. Regardless, because the water comes bursting up from underground, and because the water in the spring is recycled so often, this place almost never freezes over. In fact, when I visited, it was properly below zero degrees Fahrenheit, and I didn't even see an ice crystal on the surface of the water. As for why the water has that vibrant green color, I was surprised to find that I actually couldn't find any clear written sources giving me an explanation. But I did reach out to Dennis Green at the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. He is the supervisor at Indian Lake State Park, right next door to Kitchitakippi, and according to him, the green tint in the water comes from the water having to travel through that limestone on its way into the spring. So presumably the water is picking up some sort of minerals or other compounds from the rock. So thanks, Dennis. When it comes to life, these days, Kichitakippi isn't home to trilobites or coral reefs or the animals that might have been around when the Silurian seas covered this area. But there are some very large trout here, which I was just delighted to learn are the deep, deep descendants of those first jawed fish from the Silurian, the ones that were swimming around when the rock at the bottom of this spring was mud at the bottom of the ocean. Oh, and you know another descendant of those ancient jawed fish? Humans. We are also deep, deep descendants of bony jawed fish. So that'll throw your brain for a loop. <laughs> At the end of the day, nobody knows exactly when the ground gave way and Kichitakippi first formed. But you don't need to know everything about this place to understand that there's something special about it. And when I started learning the story, I quickly realized that this is a pretty spectacular place to take a trip back in time. Even more so than others, this story is brought to you by the folks who support my work at patreon.com slash alexisdahl. I had to do a bit of traveling for this story to get to Kichitakippi, and those folks made that possible, so thank you. If you're someone who's interested in helping me make more videos like this, you can learn more about how to do so over on Patreon. Or this is a new thing, if you're interested in supporting these videos, but monthly support just isn't for you, you can check out buymeacoffee.com slash alexisdahl. It won't literally buy me a coffee, I've got plenty of that, but it is an easy way to give one-time support and help keep this series going if you've been enjoying it and think it's valuable. And of course, if neither of those things are for you, no worries, I'm glad you're here. As always, thanks for being here and I'll see you soon.